Good evening. Welcome to Motor Mouth, brought to you by the Boyertown Museum of Historic Vehicles. And as always, here on PCTV, we're here at the Boyertown Museum. And again, yep. we're here in the diner. Yep. We're enjoying some coffee and funny cake. Funny cake, right. Yes, this evening. And a nice, uh, authentic Pennsylvania Dutchie. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Pastry. You didn't have any yet, did you? No, not yet. You, not yet. Because I, I'll probably spill it and everything. I'll yeah. wait until the camera's turned off. We'll get crumbs in our teeth. Oh, I will. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Uh, so since we're starting here in the diner, uh, we'll start out with an announcement about our next event, which is in the diner, and that's going to be Fasnacht Day, and that's on Fasnacht Day, which is February seventeenth, also known as Fat Tuesday. And it'll be right here in the diner from 11 to 3. And it's going to kind of work like our diner day events, where with uh, the price of regular admission, you can come sit in here in the diner. And for 25 cents, you can get a Fasnacht and a cup of coffee. So we hope we'll see you all then. And uh, after that, then, the next diner day is not until April 11th. So this is a good time this month to come yeah. in here and... And we and we have a group of people practicing. We do behind me here. <laughs> They're making sure it, the diner works like it should be. <laughs> yeah, is it working, guys? Definitely. <laughs> yeah, <that's>, uh, <laughs> so. And uh, let's see. After after Fosnock Day, the next event we have will be on February twenty second, and that's a Saturday. That's the third Saturday of the month, and like we talked about last time, since it is the museum's fiftieth anniversary. We're going to spend the year celebrating by having different events here the third Saturdays of every month. So in February, we're going to have uh, a little session here on how to get your car ready for the show season. And as loyal PC TV viewers will know, uh, I'm sure you all recognize uh, Mike Inessa from Wheels in Motion, and Wheels in Motion is going to be here. Uh, to sort of run that event and we all know Mike. He's a good friend of ours, a good friend of PCTV So we hope you come here and we'll uh, look for more information about that either on Facebook or our website and Looking ahead to the next month in March our third Saturday event is going to be a Hoods Up weekend and that's March 22nd and basically you'll be able to come here and when you go through the museum, we'll have a majority of the hoods up on the cars. We get a lot of questions to see the engines, why aren't the hoods open, you know, and there's a couple of reasons for that, why they aren't all the time. So we're going to have a hoods up weekend. If you want to come and really look at the engines and get a good look, come then. It's March 22nd. And, and it's, it's kind of interesting because you go to maybe a lot of museums and the, the engines under the hoods are, you know, big block Chevys or Hemi. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dodges or Plymouths and stuff like that. We don't have any of them here. But a lot, of, a lot of the engines that we do have are very strange, and you know they're a hundred years old. Yeah. So, and not just the engines, but some of the other things that are located under the hood. Yeah. Uh, I was talking earlier, uh, um, before we went on air, about the oiling systems for cars, which totally is different than what we're used to today. It's a good, a lot of experimental things you can mm -hmm. see since yep. our stuff is so old. And even when we have multiples of the same make, like Duriers, right. you'll see a lot of differences between the, the different mm -hmm. engines too, which is, I think, neat. It's not mm -hmm. all the same. So March 22nd, you want to mark your calendars for that. And uh, that's all I'm going to say for now about coming up. But I want to thank everyone out there. If you came to our, uh, our Golden Gala in January, we thank you for coming. It was a really great event. If you weren't able to make it, uh, we had over 150 people here. It was a lot of fun, a lot of great food, mm -hmm. great music, just great conversation with everybody. We unveiled the newest addition to the collection, uh, which is a 1913 SGV touring car. And now again, like I said, with the uh, we have. Some things, several examples of the same make. We had an SGV mm -hmm. from 1912. This one is totally different. Right. So totally. it's really neat to see the two next to each other. And we're going to highlight that in a future episode, but right. not tonight. Um, but we will be talking about that. But I will that say show. it has push-button transmission on. 
but it does. we won't say any more. And that's it. Yeah. 1913, push button transmission. Yep. So we'll, we'll make sure we talk about it in a later show. Um, other than that, uh, basically, I think that's about it for museum announcements coming up. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not sure, what are we going to be talking about tonight, Dan? We are going to be talking about rumble seats. Rumble seats. Rumble seats. Excellent. Okay. And the reason I'm talking about that, I was reading a, an article in a, in a book about a month ago, and they had a picture of a, I don't know, 1930 DeSoto or something like that. But they said it had a rumble seat, and they show a picture of it, and they said it was um, found, there, or the idea for a rumble seat came from somebody called Lord Rumble. Spelled R H U M B L E. I'm thinking, boy, I never <laughs> heard that. So I'm thinking, there's something to, to investigate and talk about with our viewers because we have a few cars that have rumble seats, and we'll see, we'll look at them in a couple minutes here. But uh, but some history about um, the rumble seat and in all sorts of things. And um, as I just mentioned. Um, this Lord Rumble. I looked on good old Google on the internet and searched everywhere for Lord Rumble. But I found two instances mm. and they both said kind of the same thing. And um, one of them says, Rumble seats were supposedly named for its inventor, Lord Hubert Malcolm Rumble, a prominent carriage designer of England's late 1800s, okay? supposedly named for him. I'm thinking if he is a lord or is a sir, you figure there should be something on the you internet. Would think. But nothing, okay? <laughs> so that supposedly had a lot of weight to it. Um, but then others say it was so called because of the rumbling sound it made sitting in the back. So there, there's a little idea and I think that's better um, because I investigated and I always thought rumble seats started with automobiles, okay, thusly a rumbling sound back there. But there's instances of carriages and even sleighs having a rumble seat, and it's a seat hanging out in the back there. Um, another name for it was called a spider seat. And the spider seat was that extra seat in the back of the carriage for footmen or a groom. So there you go. You had the groom who took care of the horses. You had the footman. As soon as you stopped the carriage, for the rich people, of course, um, the footman would get out and kind of open the doors and stuff. And, and they figured the rumble back there was because these were enclosed carriages. The, the, the regular passengers wouldn't hear that, but the footman sitting in the back would hear it. And that spider, um, that name came from from the mechanism that held the seat up, you know, kind of a spidery looking thing. And there's some pictures that you'll be seeing or you might be looking at right now um, about, and you can see uh, how that spidery term came in existence. Another term is called mother-in-law seat. Now, we have a car <laughs> out here and I always, I always point out to it, to, to tours and stuff, it says, does anybody know what that's called? And it's a single seat in the back of a car. And um, they say, oh, that's a mother-in-law seat. A lot of people know what that is. Um, now, that goes back to, to German. That, that's interesting. And I, I never took one lesson of German in, in <laughs> school, so I'm going to pronounce this wrong. But it's a uh, Schweigermeiter Sitz. How's oh, that sound? Let me see it. Okay. I did take German. Yeah, right, right, um, right there. Okay. Schweiger. Oh. Schwiegermutter. Oh, Schwieger, yes. Okay, yes. there we go. Uh, there's... Second. <laughs> okay. Now, to be sure about this, I went on to a German English translating thing. And that Schwieger part means silent. Mutter, okay, hold on for this. One of the definitions of mutter <laughs> is screw nut. <laughs> and the sits or shits or something is computer. So we have uh, a silent screw nut from a computer. But then there's other definitions, and that's where the mother comes in a seat and so on and so forth. But that schwieger means um, remaining silent. So 
you know, that tongue-in-cheek mother-in-law, okay, put her back there where we can't hear her. And tongue I just thought cheek. that was... Yeah, tongue-in-cheek. Yeah. <laughs> Polite okay. way to put it. <laughs> um, so, so there we go. We have the spider seat, the mother-in-law seat. We've got rumble seat. Um, in Britain, it's called the dicky seat. And, um, and that's interesting. Now, also, way back then, maybe even a little earlier, you had a couple other seats that weren't conventional as we think seats today. And one was a visa visa uh, seat, which you see, sit face to face. So I'd be driving the car and there's people right in front of me looking at me. We have some cars like that. Right, actually. we have uh, a yeah. Dorier, yep. I believe. And then there's also a dosa do or dosi do seat, which is back to back seating. And both of them are, are French terms. So there's some history with the, the rumble seat. Um, uh, let, let's see, what, what can we talk? Now, I mentioned that we have, um, you'll see pictures of uh, a carriage and also a ladies phaeton that both have seats in the back and they're kind of out be way behind the seats. And it's interesting, I was reading the, um, some of the engineering stuff for this and they said how the springs in the back of the carriage were heavier than in the front and that means if there's another person sitting way in the back there's going to be a lot more weight on that rear axle but they were designed so if there was nobody there you'd still have a comfortable ride so they kind of compensated for that um, also a sleigh there's a picture of a sleigh and we're gonna you're gonna see that um, I found a picture of a car which is a 1904, excuse me, 1902 automotor. That was the brand name of the car made in Springfield, Massachusetts. That had a rumble seat, just a little horseless carriage. So you have the, the driver and the passenger sitting side by side and out in the back, there's a guy sitting in this, um, this seat. And you look at that and you're gonna see the spider seat also. You're gonna see where that term came from. Um, now what we're going to do, we're going to go out to the museum. We're going to look at some of the vehicles we have that have um, rumble seats or mother-in-law seats or spider seats or dicky seats or I'm not going to try the German seat though. Bigger. Yeah, Bigger whatever. Stitza. So, okay. I think. Well, Dan, I'm sure you knew that we had a gift shop. Oh, yes, I do know. Yes, but maybe our viewers at home do not know. Uh, but, you know, we've got lots of stuff for sale here. Please, if you're looking for, like, an automotive gift, something with our logo, a past Durier Day item, those especially, what I last mentioned, the Durier Day items, uh, you know, those are really pretty good, well marked down, too. So you'll find some good deals here. These are from past Durier Days. Especially those glasses, they're really nice. because They're nice, heavy-duty glasses. I know I break glasses all the time at home, even just putting them in the dishwasher. These are really nice and heavy-duty. Uh, we also got lots of stuff with our logo on them. We got nice shirts, sweatshirts, hats, thermoses, coffee mugs, the travel mugs. Uh, and also very popular are diner mugs. Um, if you come here for diner day, you've been here in the past, you've probably uh, seen us selling those diner mugs. Well, they're not just for sale on diner day. They're for sale all the time. Uh, and they're really neat. So, you know, come here for that. Postcards, other car stuff like puzzles, if you've got someone uh, you're looking to buy a gift for, automotive, please stop in. And our stuff is really reasonably priced, too. Mm -hmm. so you can't really complain yeah, about I have, that. I have some shirts. And mm -hmm. I, I wear them proudly. Got some hats. I proudly wear that at Hershey. Yeah. Make sure people know where I'm from. So. And we can find you easier. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if that's the case, we should have bright green ones. Have camo ones. Yeah. Camo hats. But well, everybody that makes else you blend wears in. camo hats. Mm -hmm. so. But uh, yeah, we've got lots of stuff here. So please, if you're looking for something, a gift for somebody or for yourself, don't forget us. And uh, if you're a member of the museum, uh, you do get a discount on your gift shop. Mm -hmm purchases. That's another thing. We do have uh, membership levels. They're very reasonable. Individual memberships start at $25. That's a really great value. Um, members get a quarterly newsletter and that covers a little bit of everything that goes on here. Some 
history, uh, upcoming events, photos and details from past events. Uh, it's, it's good, right? You like the newsletter? It is, yeah. Mm -hmm. Especially when I've good contributed answer. to it. Especially your article. Yes. <laughs> Dan and I will both contribute stuff to the newsletter mm -hmm. at times. And uh, members also get into the museum free as many times as you want during the year. And that's a great value. You can come to Diner Day, both Diner Days, and not pay the admission, mm -hmm. that means. Um, and we have so many great events coming up this year that membership would come in handy. So, and if you're an individual, come to the museum five times, you might as well just buy a membership. Right. And then you'll get right. the newsletter. Because, and, and I've noticed in the past couple years that we've kind of ramped up the the uh, membership benefits, you know, mm -hmm. without having free events and stuff for the members, so that's pretty good. It's a great value. Mm -hmm. So, if you have any uh, questions about any of this, the membership, stuff for sale in the gift shop, come visit us here at 85 South Walnut Street or uh, call us, 610-367-2090, and we'd love to hear from you. Okay, here we have a 1912 SGV. This is a mother-in-law seat, in case you were wondering what one looked like. Um, we have two seats in the front, one for the driver, one for the passenger, and then we have the third one back here. Now, Kendra is gonna demonstrate how it is to sit in here. So Don't you're gonna, laugh if I fall. You, I'll catch you, okay? <laughs> so you're gonna clamber up here. And, um, there it is. Kind of a, a nice fit, doesn't it? It is, it's lovely. Okay? It's perfect. Perfect, okay. Now, here's the mother-in-law seat. The handle's seat. not attached very well. Oh, though. okay. But this car, I, I always tell people, you know, these cars didn't have the greatest suspension and roads weren't the smoothest either, and so I'm sure yeah. you bounced a lot. So if you see on the side of the seat, there is a handle. There's another mm -hmm. one on this side. Nice brass ones, in fact. Yes, yeah. And um, so I think on a rather bumpy road, you want to kind of hang on for dear life because yes. if all of a sudden you hit a big bump, you know, you'd probably get ejected out the back of the car. And the the seat be... is not very high. No. It's no, not it really isn't. holding you in at all. No. This is the car, Kendra and I and another guy <laughs> rode around Pottstown with this once. And uh, that yes. was kind of an experience. So. And we went over railroad tracks. Oh. Down High Slowly, Street. Slowly, I guess. Well, it may have been, but I was in this back seat. And I will tell you that the railroad tracks in Pottstown made me bounce higher than this seat. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, mm -hmm. I landed back in the same spot. But so, so again, this is an idea how they put extra seating in. Now, you remember I rattled off a bunch of um, terms for these seats back here, and mother-in-law seat and spider seat and so on and so forth. I saw another term for this. Um, this was for a Studebaker from about 1916, so it was four years newer than this one, and um, they called it a lackey seat for your <laughs> servant. So I'm thinking for the most part, now mother-in-law is like a secondary term almost, but the footman uh, mm -hmm. would sit back here, or the, well, not a groom for this, but maybe the mechanic would sit back here, or your servant, or a lackey. Yeah. You know, lackey meaning, you know, like a second-rate citizen, I guess it would consider. And so that's what you had back here in this part of the car. Now, do you think the owner would ever sit back here only because I mean would he drive the whole time I would I, think some of them had chauffeurs I'm thinking if I was the owner and I'd own the, this car you would I'd be driving because this is kind of a sporty car yeah and um, yeah you know so I don't I don't think the owner would be back here or I think somewhere I heard that maybe they did have a chauffeur and when it was the owner's turn to drive he'd send the chauffeur okay. back Okay. I don't know if this is true or not, but, but I think the point is, yeah, this was for someone not quite on the level of the, mm -hmm. the owner. Because this was a, an expensive car. Right. Now, not, it, it, I don't think rumble seats were exclusive to expensive cars, though. Right. But in a car like this, yeah, probably you'd mm -hmm. send the servant to the back. Right. Okay. Or me. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Okay, here we have a 1909 Middle B, um, Reading built car, as the previous SGV was. Uh, this air cool car, this is kind of a neat one too. Um, this is more the, a rumble seat, kind of like 
I expect the rumble seat to be. Um, the lady sitting in it is not real. She's fake, okay? Um, anyway, this rumble seat here folds down. The, the back of this folds down to the to seat part, and the whole thing flips over, and you can see this, this um, side part will fit right into this cutout here. And this is kind of getting into the design of rumble seats that we kind of would have seen in a Model A Ford or, um, or you know, an, an early 30s vehicle that was made. But this is kind of an early type of rumble seat. We have an, another, I think we got a couple of Dorias that have seats similar to this also. Um, but I decided to show you this one too. So again, 1909. So again, we're having um, the SGV is 1912 and that didn't quite have the rumble seat that we know of that just had a permanent seat, whereas this one kind of folds in and out. Okay, here we have a 1918 Biddle. Um, this is a Philadelphia built car. Um, we've had this car about a year, I guess. Yeah, not long. It's okay. pretty new. But anyway, this has a rumble seat. This is even closer to like what we know and love as a rumble seat. Yeah. And um, I'm going to have my assistant Kendra open this up. That and reminds me, you had a fake assistant in the last car. I did? We'll have to have words about that. Oh, he wasn't okay. very animated. No. no. <laughs> well, I don't know. Before we open this up, we have got these little latches type or little hinge latches, things. Yeah. Thing. What? I believe what these are, you, you open these up, you can put like a screwdriver in there and such, and they, they latch it so as you're cruising down the road, it's yep. not going to. Um, you're right, flop there is up. a little mm -hmm. uh, a, a lock in there, like There's a bolt in there side. you can move. So yeah. then it wouldn't flap on you as you're. Right. Speeding mm -hmm. down Roosevelt Boulevard. Yeah, yeah. at 120. Exactly. <laughs> so. All right, shall we open her uh, up? We, sh we shall. Okay. There we go. Okay, there we are. Um, that's our rumble seat. And I am thinking once you get in this car, you could probably put this back down over your, your legs. Mm -hmm. Hopefully you don't have too large of If you're a small person, yeah. yeah. And, but most um, of these cars, you have to be small to even drive them. Yeah. So. And um, I like this because the, it's upholstered, this nice green color uh, matches upholstery inside the, the regular cab, um, the step to get in. And, um, and, you know, these are not exactly the easiest cars to get in, I don't mm. think. And um, I'm not demonstrating. No, that. you don't have to. <laughs> and, and you figure, this is 1918, and you figured that the uh, clothes like ladies would wear, this would not be good for them, I guess. And even and the shoes. Over. Yeah. I mean, they weren't wearing sneakers. No. So. So this is. I imagine there's a lot of, a lot of these cars have dents and scratches mm -hmm. right about where that step is mm -hmm. as women kicked it or slipped. And, or... and, but, you know, but this was the sporty thing. A lot mm -hmm. of times you see a sporty thing and um, you end up, you know, sacrificing some practicality, we'll say. Doesn't seem very ladylike no, it getting doesn't. into it. No. And there's the steps only on one side. Right. We were at, we were gonna film this from the other angle and then we realized there's no step mm -hmm. over here. And it's, it's from the curb there. side, so you'd be getting True. in from the curb. So. That is very gentlemanly of Yes. Of but you. um you know, we looked at the S G V and we also looked at the middle B. You can get in from both sides. Mm -hmm. They're ambidextrous. That's right. Okay, what we have here is a 1928 LaSalle. This is not made in Reading. But anyway, this has a rumble seat too, and we have a real live person in the back. This is Joe, by the way. Say hi, okay. And um, to get in here, we see three steps on here. So it makes it a little more easy to get in, at least for a man. And this is something I forgot about until just a moment ago, as Kendra opened this little door in the side here. They called it a golf bag door or a golf door or something, and you could store things in here. We happen to have a bunch of old golf clubs in there. Take my word for it. Um, but it's interesting. I always thought, why did, did they always call this a golf door or a golf bag door? My understanding is that this is one of those custom bodies, and the customer wanted a compartment for his golf club. Okay. But I, I see that on other cars. You see it elsewhere? Go, but 
you know, let's be practical with this too. And I'm gonna ask Joe, if you had to get something down where your feet are, how would you get it? I mean, it's pretty yeah. difficult. I mean, yeah, you want a door on the side. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so I think that's the real reason. And golf clubs too. And golf clubs. Maybe fishing poles. Okay. All right. Well, that's that's it with our LaSalle. Well, we're going to highlight a uh, visitor here in the museum. Uh, this is an absolutely beautiful car. This is a 1930 Lincoln convertible Phaeton, and it's on loan to us. Uh, I'm not sure when it's leaving. It's here for the winter, though. So <clears throat> if you would like to see this in person, you need to get down here pretty We could pretty hold soon. it as a hostage. I've thought about that. Don't, mm -hmm. don't tell the owner. That okay, I, I won't. He's right. probably watching. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but uh, he very generously lent, lent this to us. It looks great here. Um, this is a, an eight-cylinder L-head engine underneath the hood there, and this should still be here for the Hoods Up okay. weekend, so hopefully we'll have it open for you then. You can take a look at the engine. Uh, now, this is a Lincoln. It doesn't really, you would think, fit into our uh, Pennsylvania theme. It will, though, in a minute. Go ahead. Look, I'm anticipating your question. Uh, no, it wasn't a question. <laughs> I was just going to, I'm sorry. A little history on Lincoln. Um, it was founded by a gentleman named Henry Leland, and he actually also started uh, Cadillac. Well, he sold Cadillac to uh, General Motors in 1909, but he stayed with them until 1917, and he actually left because he had a disagreement with uh, the GM president, William Durant. And here's a picture of both those men, uh, Leland and Durant. Now, basically, apparently, crux of the disagreement was supposedly that Durant didn't want to convert to military production during World War I. Leland did. Supposedly, he specifically wanted to do aviation uh, stuff. But Durant didn't want this. So Leland left to start the Lincoln Motor Company. He got a government contract, uh, but <laughs> a good thing and a bad thing for him, they declared peace. So they didn't have a need for him to fulfill this government contract, but here he was with this huge manufacturing plant and a workforce, and now he had no work for them to do. So he basically uh, turned to what he knew, which was luxury cars. So he started to build uh, Lincoln cars, and that's where we started with these. Now, even though he had a lot of experience with Cadillac, uh, almost immediately Lincoln was suffering some financial problems. Typical story in the early car industry. So many makers, and they so quickly start having money issues, and he was no different. Uh, and he basically sold the company pretty quickly. Uh, it was purchased by I want to guess. Henry Ford. Of course. When in doubt, the answer is Henry Ford, probably. Or Redding, I say here. Okay. <laughs> but uh, Henry Ford, yeah, he purchased it. I was going to say Babe Ruth. <laughs> He's the answer to all the trivia. I'm sorry. I thought Honus Wagner was the answer. <laughs> <to all. laughs> okay. Sorry. Uh, so Henry Ford purchased it for $8 million back in 1920. And Leland left pretty soon after that. And actually, Edsel Ford then kind of headed up the uh, Lincoln division. Mm -hmm. And you know, why did Henry Ford buy Lincoln? I guess he kind of wanted a luxury car to sort of partner with his Model T. And that seemed to be more of Edsel's thing, was the, the kind of higher end stuff. I don't think Edsel was too intrigued by his dad's well, from Model what I understand K. about Edsel, he was involved, he, he was really interested in mm -hmm. design and staying modern and stuff. Yes. And pop was kind of, you Not know, he so was much. in his ways and he didn't want to advance too much. Right, so. right. Yeah, I get that impression too. Mm -hmm. They were very different people, yes. it seems. So this was, I guess Lincoln sort of became Edsel's baby, so to mm -hmm. speak. Uh, so that's a little history on the Lincoln. Why the heck is this car here? Well, <clears throat> if you'll notice this absolutely beautiful bodywork on this car, uh, we talk a lot here about Fleetwood body, and we have some Fleetwood examples here. 
Fleetwood uh, Metal Body Company, which was a custom car builder. This has a Durham body. Durham, it's spelled D-E-R-H-A-M. And Durham's were built in Rosemont, Pennsylvania, which is down like in the Bryn Mawr area, main line. 11 miles west of Center City, Philadelphia. Just 11 miles? 11. That surprised me. That's too. hard to believe. Yeah. Hmm. It'd take you a long time with the traffic to get there. Probably. <laughs> Yeah, so this is a Durham body, and uh, it was founded by a gentleman named Joseph Durham. And he started with a carriage business. Again, very common story. These guys started in the carriage industry and modernized. And he started doing car bodies for people who had touring cars, but wanted enclosed bodies for the wintertime. And we talked about this a little last month about driving in the winter and how sometimes a lot of people didn't even drive in the winter because they had these open cars, not very good mm -hmm. in the snow. We talked a little bit about you know, people who would just jack up the cars basically all winter and not touch them. Well, he was doing these enclosed bodies for people who did want to do winter driving. And what he would do was basically you kept the chassis and the engine and he would build you like an alternate body instead of you going out and buying a whole new car because this is before the days where people having two cars was pretty normal. Mm -hmm. um, he would actually bu uh, build a second body. You could also hire uh, him to s switch the bodies as the seasons changed and he would store the body you weren't using. And this was more economical than buying two cars? I guess. Yeah. I guess. It seems... And I, I guess also, if you took the body off, I know like the paint and stuff wouldn't really hold up on these cars. So maybe they did yeah. body maintenance and off season. They did get into that, yeah. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about that a little later, actually. They did okay. get into that. And I also wonder, too, you're saying, was it more economical? You know, we just talked earlier about how different all the engines were. I imagine if you got used to how your car worked, mm -hmm. Who, how would you even find one that was very similar to it? I mean, today, really, and my family has a Honda and a Toyota. Does it really matter which one? I, you just turn the key and you go. Back mm -hmm. then, it was so different. We had all these steps to starting a car, and right. they're all very different. So I imagine if you got used to something and liked it, you'd mm -hmm. maybe want to keep that as much as you can. Uh, now, after he, he started doing that, he did start branching into doing work for the car companies themselves. And a lot of those luxury car manufacturers like Packard, uh, Pierce Aero, again, the very, very high-end stuff. So for the most part, these were pretty uh, rich customers, I'd say. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Fleetwood, we always talk about Fleetwood was very high-end. Mm -hmm. From my understanding, Durham was even well, more you, up there. You, know, you look at the way you describe where they made these. Mm -hmm. They were on the main line. And yeah. main line was money. Oh, sure, and, yeah. Um, and so I figure all the, the, the rich folk in there, you know, it was yeah. a local business. Lots so. of those business owners with businesses and manufacturing plants in Philly, they got their mainline mansions. I mean, you mm -hmm. still see them today. Correct. So th mm -hmm. these are the kinds of clientele, really, he's serving. Well, Joseph Durham died in 1928, and the business never really was the same after that. His sons, there was a rift between them and how to operate the business. One left took some of the Durham workers with him and started a different hmm. business. So uh, not always the same. Now this car in particular, uh, you look at the roof line and like Dan and I were saying, the owner explained it so well and I'm probably not going to explain it so well. But uh, that roof design, uh, specifically I guess the, the, there's like a dip to it, like two levels and also that middle uh, what Dan was pointing at here um, like a, I think they call it like a trapezoidal window, I think. Is Sounds what I good. Was, yeah. Sounds like another German word. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was, it's a similar design uh, to another uh, designer's car, and they were called Hibbert and Darren. They were two Americans, but they were working in Paris, right. France. So it's kind of European design of sorts. And they debuted this design the year before this car, so 1929, at the Paris Salon. It's probably not pronounced Salon. 
That didn't sound sneaky. I don't know French, French either. I don't either. I didn't no. take French. Um, there's disagreement over whether or not Hibbert and Darren allowed them to use that design, but it's not the way you think it is because apparently Durham admits they stole the design and they didn't mm. have the rights, and Hibbert and Darren says, no, no, we allowed them to use it, so I don't know. How about that? But you'd think it would go the other way. Mm -hmm. They don't want to admit that they're stealing a yeah. design, but yeah, oh well. Um, yeah, so that's kind of a, a, a European feel, I guess, to some of their stuff. Which again, you know, European cars were considered very luxury, high end, really expensive. So of course, you're going to want to copy them. Um, <clears throat> now, there there were some very famous owners of Durham bodies, including Joseph Stalin, hmm. President Eisenhower. Um, and one in particular is very famous, Gary Cooper. He had a Durham. It's still on display, I think, out in California in a museum. And uh, it was a 1930 Model J Duesenberg. Okay. Again, a Duesenberg, pretty expensive, high-end car. And it's, to me, it's not the most pleasing colors. It's like a yellow, uh, what do they call it? Prim primrose yellow body, Parkway green fenders. And apparently, when he bought it, they are estimating he paid, well, he paid about 14500 for it, hmm. which today is like 80-some, no, it's more than that. It's, it's over $2 million, I think, actually, in today's it's money. It's a lot. Not $2 million. Yeah, $2 million. I've got to look that up. <laughs> Very expensive. <laughs> yeah. But uh, they mm. estimate that of that, about $5,000 of that went for just the body work. Mm -hmm. They're estimating. It's hard because they didn't really have a catalog for us to look in because they did so much custom work. Mm -hmm. It's not like we can look up the model that they did and, and try to figure it out. Um, so in any case, now Durham, surprisingly, despite all that strife with the sons arguing, they did manage to last a pretty long time. Uh, they got through the Great Dep Depression, a lot of the reason because most of their customers were in Philadelphia. Their customers were, for the most part, local. And as you were saying, they, with the wear and tear of mounting and dismounting those bodies, they did do a lot of repair and restoration work on their own stuff. Um, so that's kind of how they got through the Great Depression. They also did other makers' bodies, too. They would fix those up as well. Uh, but they also survived the 30s by becoming a Plymouth and DeSoto dealer. So mm. That was another way they kind of supplemented okay. their income. And, and that's why I've seen a lot of pictures of Durham that are like DeSotos and Chryslers, mm -hmm. and I guess that was their connection up until yeah, yeah. the 50s even. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because a lot of Great Depression obviously killed a lot of businesses, mm -hmm. and you would think a business like this, which is serving the very, very wealthy, but they managed to get through it. And yeah, so probably they also probably firmed up their relationship with hmm. DeSoto and to do their body work too. Uh, now the building uh, still does exist today. That's, and there's a photo of it. And that's really the only photo of it that I could find. Hmm. I, okay. You know, I can keep looking, but I could only really find a modern one. Um, and today they're a Ferrari parts dealer. Okay. That's how. And then how long did they stay in business? Do you know? Um, it seems closed? as though they were advertising their auto restoration services as late as 1967. Mm -hmm. And that's, it doesn't look like they were really making new things by that point anymore, but they were still. I, I got in a, um, Argument, conversation. I got in a conversation hey, with some people and we were talking about Durham body cars. Mm -hmm. And somebody said, yeah, they went up to the 80s. And so being the being type you. of person, yeah, <laughs> being me, um, I says I can just picture a, a Chrysler K car with a custom body on it. And so there's a lot of laughter with that. But um, this well, is. You know, I thought I did nice. read somewhere that they were, in, they were doing armored cars at the end too you know like the mm -hmm. things that travel between the banks and the stuff i thought i read that and then prepping for tonight i couldn't find it mm -hmm. again mm -hmm. so i gotta keep looking for that so, so now this car i mean it mm -hmm. looks great but mm -hmm. is there i mean the interior is it 
just as um, nice inside? I'm sure it was. I, I think so. And, you know, I'm not sure. Maybe you know. the. I don't know how much work the owner now has really done to it. I, I don't know. Yeah, and I, he's had it for a good, a good mm -hmm. while. Um, but I, I've read, like, with these custom cars, custom body cars from the 20s and 30s, mm -hmm. that, you know, you could go in, the customer would go into um, a, a, a sales office of Durham. There's probably one, like, in New York or Philadelphia, and you go and you sit down. They got all the books there. And then I say, okay, we have this body style and that, and they have all these different kinds. Mm -hmm. But that was the easy part, I think. The hard part was like, well, I want this kind of cloth on it, and I want this, and maybe put a light over here and this and that, and, yeah. and it's really customized. And, um, you know, it's some really neat stuff. You don't see many custom body cars. No, no, not really anymore at all. Mm -hmm. it's, you get what the factory gives you. And, and I saw... At, at Hershey this past year, they had two Durham body cars for sale. One was about a 1940 Cadillac, and another one was about 1947. I could be off with the years a little bit. One right before World War II, one right after. Now, they look like regular Cadillacs, except the interior was really nice. Yeah. And these cars here, these older, like 1930, I don't want to use the word um, a module type thing, but it's kind of that idea of where is it would just bolt right to the chassis here. And you mm -hmm. were saying earlier how easy it, or how much they switch bodies on these yeah. cars. So, you know, you can't do it that easy. I know uh, it seems that seems car. like a lot of work to me, but that's what he really his bread and butter in the beginning. It mm -hmm. couldn't have been that difficult, mm -hmm. which yep. is amazing to me that you were able to sustain a business yeah. like that at first. So. Huh. Yeah, so that's a little bit about our Lincoln. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not our Lincoln. Yeah. It's our, our, our visiting Lincoln. <laughs> visiting so, Lincoln, yes. <laughs> so, yeah, like I said, be sure to get here before the winter's over and, and, and take a look at it. It really mm -hmm. is a beautiful car. Yep. And it's right in front of our gas station, exactly. too. Exactly. It's perfect. So. <laughs> okay. Um, we were talking about rumble seats. Now we're back at the rumble seat stuff again. Um, a lot of people want to know... When's the last rumble seat made? When's the last rumble seated car, I'll say? Um, I have found out over the years, when you're talking about the first or the last <laughs> of something with cars or trucks, you don't really say that because then all of a sudden somebody will say something else. But anyway. That's um, very true. I, I, that all the time. I, I read somewhere, it was definitive, 1939 Plymouth had the last rumble seat. Well, then I read somewhere else that Ford's had them and somebody else had them and this had them, so I'm not going to even go there. Um, then I read also that the 1946 to 1949 Triumph 1800 to 2000 uh, Roadster um, had a dicky seat or a rumble seat. You'll see pictures of that, uh, the front and the back. And what's interesting about this, it's a little sports car. You, normally you'd say, oh, it's a two-seater, but the trunk lid or the rumble seat or the dicky seat lid opens up. There's also a windshield back there. So the back seat people had their own windshield. And I've seen these cars with the that rear seat down and up. And it's interesting when it's down because you, you look at it and there's this uh, a, a windshield there that's flush with the back of the car. So again, that's 46 or 49. Then somebody mentioned uh, my... Um, my coworker, Chris, he mentioned one day the Subaru Brat. I don't know if anybody can remember. It was a little pickup truck. And they didn't really have a rumble seat type thing. But in the, the bed of this little bitty pickup truck was two plastic or fiberglass seats with handles so you could hold on. <laughs> and it was this fun thing. Now, I did a little bit of research. It was made from uh, 78 to 93. And Brat. I just thought that was the name, Subaru Brat. It just sort of worked. But it actually stood for something. By Drive Recreational All-Terrain Transporter. I think they came up with the name <laughs> Brat first. And yes. said, How can we make this work? They worked so, backwards on that one. Yeah. But anyway, it, I found out some other interesting things about it. U.S. versions had the carpeting and welded in rear-facing jump seats in the cargo area. Um, Actually, the reason they had them is to circumvent, 
a tariff known as the chicken tax. You ever hear of the chicken tax? Sadly, no. No. Well, you're going to hear about okay. it today. Okay, and I'll, I'll read this. Although the Brat could fairly be called a truck, the plastic seats in the cargo bed allowed Subaru to classify the Brat as a passenger car. This left little cargo space and also caused fatalities and serious injuries and accidents. <laughs> no, no kidding. Let me tell you what the chicken tax is. 25% tariff on potato starch, dextrin, brandy, and light trucks imposed 1963 by the United States in response to tariffs placed by France and West Germany, getting equal for the, the German I tried talking about earlier, uh, France and West Germany on the importation of U.S. chicken. So they were throwing a tariff on the chicken that was going from this country to theirs, and so we said, let's show those guys. Eventually, the tariffs on potato starch, dextrin, and brandy were lifted, but over the next 48 years, the light truck tax became stagnant, remaining in place to protect U.S. automakers from foreign competition. Now you know all about the chicken tax. Go home and tell your kids that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like hey, be let me tell you, you learn about everything on here. Everything. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I have uh, some more pictures here. Interesting rumble seat accessories or aftermarket stuff. Um, I love... Um, aftermarket stuff. I have a book floating around here somewhere. Let me get it for you right here. <laughs> I have this book here. It's called Those Wonderful Unauthorized Accessories for Model A Ford. If you can find this, this is great. It's a whole book and it's nothing but advertisements for aftermarket stuff for Model A Fords. It's like someone knew that Dan Olson needed this book Absolutely. and made it. Yep. That's so sweet yep. of them. And um, I found some bug. stuff in there. One of them is the Hampton Auto Top and Metal Company out of Springfield, Massachusetts. And um, they made a roof for a rumble seat. And they said, as necessary as the car top itself, easy to attach on and off in a jiffy, can be folded flat and carried in a utility bag, furnished. Furnished in waterproof top material and black or sport colors to harmonize with top. That's in 1928. Cost you 15 bucks. If you wanted side curtains on it, it would be 21 bucks. There's another one called Rumble uh, Tuxedo Rumble Seat Top, made by William Harrison Company out of St. Paul, Minnesota, same year, 1928. Um, they they said from Fifth Avenue to Hollywood, they're going over big. So that was interesting. That also cost 15 dollars. Um, said, you know, make sure you get your orders in. We've got an avalanche of orders. Great little shelter for the rumble seaters. Shows that human nature is the same everywhere. They all want that added touch. They all want its style, swank, swank, swank. and cozy feeling. You'd be surprised how it protects from the weather, dust, and that night from glaring uh, headlights and so on and so forth. Another one was called Tux Away by Brewer and Titchener of Cortland, New York. Um, you see a picture of that. You see a picture of um, some people sitting in one. That's Jimmy Cagney and Joe Blondell. <laughs> and it was um, a promotional uh, picture for um, a, a show from 1931 called Blonde Crazy. Celebrity endorsements. Oh, absolutely. I love it. It's great. And, and you'll see another picture, a, a color picture. And it's 1932 Ford. Is that some show? And this isn't from back then, this is from now. Um, I tried finding more information and I, I searched around, couldn't find any more information for that. Um, anyway, they were the tux away, um, rumble seat roofs. Um, let's see, what else do we have here? How about rumble seat side wings so you don't get all the air there? It was like a <laughs> windshield and a side wing. Um, there was a company called American Injector Company. So uh, every rumble seat car owner wants a set. So you see a picture of that. Another one I found, uh, opening rear window. You would take, like on a Model A, this is for you. You would take the window out of the car for the rear window on a coupe, and you put this, this um, opening window. It's called Deluxe Rear Window. Window spelling W-I-N-D dash O by an advanced manufacturing company of Chicago. Wait. Permits communication with rumble seat occupants. And uh, that costs $12 for Fords. It's easily installed while you wait. I'm thinking, who installs it though? I don't know. 
And last is like the coolest thing I saw. This, this you could buy, I saw, I, I read that it could be done by the factory. I also read that it could be done by the, the dealer. I don't think the, the factory would do this, but it was called the bird's nest. It was for a 1957 Thunderbird. You take the trunk lid off and you put another lid in there with the seat and so on and so forth. And you see a picture of that. Um, huh. Removal trunk lid was the only necessary thing. No drilling or cutting. It was just the new seat and everything would clamp right in there. So it could be for two adults or three children. I don't, I don't know. That might be kind of tight though. So that's the bird's nest, 1957 Thunderbird. And I found a number of these online. I've never seen one live, but yeah. there's people selling them and there's some out there. And so that's pretty much it for rumble seats. You know, and you answered a question I was having earlier, which is those poor people in the back get mm -hmm. no coverage from yeah. the elements. Well, there you go. They need the Hampton Auto could. Top. They do, or the Tux. Tuxedo rumble seat top, Gosh. or the Tux Away. Tux Away. And, yeah. uh, or the American Injector Company yeah. rumble seat side wings. I was wondering. That's a mouthful. Poor people. So. All right, okay. that's rumble that's seats. It. Yep. And uh, just before we say goodnight here, um, a reminder, we are always looking for more volunteers. If you're interested in volunteering with the museum, uh, contact us here. Uh, I don't even think I gave our generic information in the beginning, which is the Boyertown Museum so. is located at 85 South Walnut Street in Boyertown, Pennsylvania. And we're open Tuesday through Sundays, 9.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. And if you'd like to volunteer, contact us here at 610-367-2090. If you want to ask any other questions, that's a good phone number to use too. Uh, and also, we are going to be starting an email mailing list. Uh, so if you're interested in you know, staying up to date on events here, new acquisitions like 1913 SGVs or what have you, uh, you can sign up for our email mailing list. Just uh, mail our generic email address here at the museum. It's mail, M-A-I-L at boyertownmuseum.org to ask to be added to that list. And uh, that's about it, I guess. We'll wrap up for the evening. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. And I want to thank our, our friends from the Boyertown Bulletin who joined us here this evening. Thanks, guys. Uh, you can pick up a copy of the Bulletin actually here at our museum. We have it in the lobby. It's free. It's great, full of local news. Uh, and a bunch of other locations too around the area. And if you pick it up, you'll have the schedule for this show, Motormouth, and when it airs too. So be sure you stop in and pick up a copy. And thanks too to Joe who joined us tonight and was our model in the LaSalle. Oh, great. <laughs> he braved climbing into that thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's about it until next month and we'll see see what that brings then. Oh yeah. Don't ride in the rumble seat when it snows. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Well Dan, I'm sure you knew that we had a gift shop. Oh yes, I do know. Yeah, so yeah. maybe our viewers at home do not know, uh, but you know, we've got lots of stuff for sale here. Please, if you're looking for like an automotive gift, something with our logo, a past Durier Day item, those especially, what I last mentioned, the Durier Day items, uh, you know, those are really pretty good, well marked down, too. So you'll find some good deals here. These are from past Durier days, especially those glasses. They're really nice because they're nice, heavy-duty glasses. I know I break glasses all the time at home, even just putting them in the dishwasher. These are really nice and heavy-duty. Uh, we also got lots of stuff with our logo on them. We got nice shirts, sweatshirts, hats, thermoses, coffee mugs, the travel mugs. Uh, and also very popular are diner mugs. Um, if you come here for diner day, you've been here in the past, you've probably uh, seen us selling those diner mugs. Well, they're not just for sale on diner day, they're for sale all the time. Uh, and they're really neat. So, you know, come here for that. Postcards, other car stuff like puzzles, if you've got someone uh, you're looking to buy a gift for, automotive, please stop in. And our stuff is really reasonably priced too. Mm -hmm. You can't really complain yeah, about I have, that. I have a 
some shirts. And, mm -hmm. uh, I wear them proudly. Got some hats. I proudly wear that at Hershey. Yeah. Make sure people know where I'm from. So. And we can find you easier. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if that's the case, we should have bright green ones. Some camo ones. Yeah. Camo hats. But well, everybody that makes else you blend wears in. camo hats. Yeah. So. But uh, yeah, we've got lots of stuff here. So please, if you're looking for something, a gift for somebody or for yourself, don't forget us. And uh, if you're a member of the museum, uh, you do get a discount on your gift shop mm -hmm. purchases. That's another thing. We do have uh, membership levels. They're very reasonable. Individual memberships start at $25. That's a really great value. Um, members get a quarterly newsletter and that covers a little bit of everything that goes on here, some history, uh, upcoming events, photos and details from past events. Uh, it's, it's good, right? You like the news? It is, yeah. Mm -hmm. Especially when I've good contributed answer. to it. Especially your article. Yes. <laughs> Dan and I will both contribute stuff to the newsletter mm -hmm. at times. And uh, members also get into the museum free as many times as you want during the year. And that's a great value. You can come to Diner Day, both Diner Days, and not pay the admission, mm -hmm. that means. Um, and we have so many great events coming up this year that membership would come in handy. So, and if you're an individual, come to the museum five times, you might as well just buy a membership. Right. And then you'll get right. the newsletter. Because, and, and I've noticed in the past couple years that we've kind of ramped up the the um, membership benefits, you know, mm -hmm. about having free events and stuff for the members, and so that's pretty good. It's a great value. Mm -hmm. So, if you have any uh, questions about any of this, the membership, stuff for sale in the gift shop, come visit us here at 85 South Walnut Street or uh, call us at 610-367-2090, and we'd love to hear from you. Okay.